Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today we're interrupted in our ongoing message series, World Under Attack, to bring you this message, the great day of the feast. Right now, the Feast of Booths is being celebrated in Israel. And this Wednesday will be the last day of the feast. The Feast of Booth is one of the three pilgrimage feasts that every adult male Israelite was required to attend. Jesus himself attended the feast. And we'll talk more about that in this message about one of his attendances at the Feast of Booth. Next week, we will return to our message series, World Under Attack. But for now, let's get right into our message this morning, the great day of the feast. Please turn with me to our scripture reading found in John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, this he said about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This feast that Jesus was crying out at was the Feast of Booths, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. It was celebrated in remembrance of the 40 years the Israelites spent in the desert after coming out of Egypt where they served as slaves for 430 years. Now, if we back up to the beginning of chapter seven, we will find that Jesus's family were going to this feast, this feast of booths in Jerusalem. It says, speaking of Jesus, so his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works his secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Now that is really, really hard. It's actually discouraging when not even your own family want to be a part of your ministry or support your ministry or even believe in your ministry. That's really rough. But this is how Jesus answered them. John chapter 7, verse 6 through 9. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it, that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. Even though Jesus said that he was not going, he apparently changed his mind and he too went to the feast. But he went privately. That is, he went secretly. He knew that the Jews were looking for him at the feast, and they were. There was so much chatter and murmuring about him among the people. Everybody was talking. Everybody was whispering. People were torn on what to think. Some thought this. Others thought that. Some were saying, oh, he's a good man. While others were saying, no, he's leading the people astray. But no one was talking openly about him because of fear of the Jews. See, fear will keep you quiet. Fear will keep you silent. Fear will hush you up because fear is an intimidator. Fear is a bully, but fear is a liar. What was it that we learned in our series that we just preached, World Under Attack? Silence is the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil. But here's the thing. When evil triumphs, it not only triumphs, but it will grow. 
It will flourish. It will expand until it chokes any and every semblance of truth completely out of existence. Everything you are told, everything that you're taught will be a lie. But anyway, in the middle of the feast, Jesus went into the temple and began to teach. When they heard him teaching, the Jews marveled and said, How is it that this man has learned when he has never studied? Although they hated him, they recognized that what he was teaching was accurate and even more in depth than they themselves understood or that they themselves were teaching. But the haters we have today have no respect for scripture or for the teaching of Jesus. They don't even have respect for Jesus himself. I heard a high profile pastor once say that Jesus took scripture out of context more times than not. Can you believe that? Apparently, this pastor understood scripture far better. His understanding was exceeding Jesus' understanding of scripture. Because Jesus took scripture out of context. Can you believe? Jesus, now think about this. Jesus, the word that became flesh, took his own scripture out of context. Not once, not twice, but more times than not. He misinterpreted his own scripture. And if that is the case, right? If that is the case, then those people who said, no, he's leading the people astray, they're correct in saying that. So why should we believe Jesus when he says, you heard it said, but I say, those kinds of erroneous teachings only lead to doubt Jesus' words and doubt his teachings. But if that is not bad enough, I saw a clip the other day with a female pastor saying, and I quote, there are countless examples that is just one of them where I see someone wearing the name of Christianity and I cringe because it does not look like the Christianity I want to be associated with. What's worse is when you get to actual stories in scripture that make you go, oh. And what example does she use? I'll tell you. She uses Jesus as her example. Jesus himself. This is what she said, and I'm going to quote her again. The example that she used is, and I quote, Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. And I need this because we often aren't given permission to say, I don't like that thing in scripture because it's such a sacred text, but it is a text that can handle some wrestling. Jesus' treatment of the Syrophoenician woman is the last example of Christianity that I want. Yes. Friends, you heard that right. She said, Jesus' treatment is the last example of Christianity that she wants. She went on to say concerning the Syrophoenician woman, she's desperate. Her daughter is suffering and comes to Jesus begging for help. And he basically says that she is less than a dog. I mean, it is not a good look on Jesus. And I hate that it's supposed to be upheld as scriptural example for us. Because that's not the Jesus I pray to. That is not the Jesus I know. We're also trying to encapsulate Jesus into this one unmovable, unchangeable thing. Jesus didn't just come as full God walking around amongst us. Jesus came to be fully human. End of quote. So. What are you saying with that statement? Are you saying that Jesus came to make mistakes? What exactly do you mean by that? But one thing that you're right about, ma'am, the Jesus that you know 
and the Jesus that you pray to does not sound like the Jesus of the Bible. You have been deceived. You are worshiping a different Jesus than the Jesus of Nazareth from the Bible. Because, make no mistake, Jesus is unmovable. Jesus is unchangeable because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, I am the Lord. I do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. That means you too, ma'am. You too. You better be glad for the unfailing, unmovable, unchangeable, steadfast love of God. Yes, Jesus was fully God operating or living on earth as fully or 100% man. But for you to say that Jesus, who happens to be the author and finisher of our faith, is not a good example of Christianity. And in fact, he is the last example of Christianity that you want. It's probably blasphemous and high treason against the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, if you go back and you listen or read through her quote, she just lumped Jesus in with all the other people that she deemed hypocrites. People she doesn't want to be associated with. Ma'am, you better make sure that you're right with the Lord. You better think strongly about repenting of things like that. It's like when people say that the God of the Muslims and the God of the Christians are all the same God. Well, to put it bluntly, they're flat out mistaken. They're wrong. First of all, Allah said he has no son. Chapter 23, verse 91 of the Quran. While Yahweh says in Psalms 2, verse 12, Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him, the Son. Psalms 2 is talking about God the Father and his anointed, his one and only begotten Son, whom the nations rage against and the people plot in vain against, and the kings of the earth set themselves against, and the rulers take counsel together against. His name is Jesus, the Holy and Anointed One, the one born of a virgin who lived a sinless life, who was crucified, died, and was buried for three days and for three nights, and who rose again on the third day, never to be killed, never to suffer again, never to be abused ever again, because he is seated at the right hand of power, and he's coming back in all his glory, in all his majesty, to judge the living, and the dead. Yes, his name is Jesus. He is the first and he is the last. He is the Alpha and he is the Omega. He is the beginning and he is the end. He is the one and only true and living God. He is the one who said on the last day of the feast, that great day of the feast, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. It is this Jesus whom it is said of, that salvation is found in no one else but him. And only by his name that anyone at all is saved. Because there is no other name given unto man by which he must be saved. Therefore, Jesus is the best example of what Christianity looks like, what Christianity is, not today's watered down version of some lip wrist, long hair, hush puppy, shoe wearing hippie singing Kumbaya. For he, Jesus, is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he is King of Glory. He is the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. That is who Jesus is. There's no other God like him. 
for indeed there is no God but him, for he is God and God alone. Therefore, serve him with a whole heart, with much joy and much reverence, for he alone is Savior. Our scripture said that on the great day of the feast, amongst all the uncertainty about him, amongst all the doubt and fear, Jesus stood up and offered salvation to the people. He offered hope. He offered life eternal. And he is still offering it today. Listen, the feasts all were a shadow of the good things to come, according to both Paul and the writer of the book of Hebrews. Jesus either fulfilled the feast for those feasts that have already been fulfilled, like the Passover and the others, or will be fulfilled by Jesus, like this feast right here that we're talking about, the Feast of Booths, also known as the Feast of Sakat or the Feast of Tabernacles. Because during this time, the people leave their homes and live in tents or makeshift huts for the entire feast. Then they return home. I want us to take a look at how they celebrated this feast. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 33 through 36. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, on the 15th day of the seventh month, for seven days is the feast of booths to the Lord. And on the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offering to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. Now, I want you to watch this. When you translate word for word the word 15th, it is not a word meaning 15th. It is actually two words, five and 10. So when translating word for word, it reads five, 10 day. That is really meaningful if you understand it prophetically. The number five is the number of the church, the bride of Christ. And the number 10 is the number of covenant. In other words, God has made an everlasting, unchangeable agreement with his church that he has bound himself to. Therefore, it is his solemn promise to fulfill what he has vowed. And what has he vowed? That we, his bride, his church, will live with him for all eternity, never to be overcome by hate or sin or temptation ever, ever, ever again, but live in peace and harmony with God and with each other. Praise his holy name. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great and unchangeable promises. Now, the number seven, as in the seventh month and for seven days, is the number for completion because this feast all wraps up everything. With this feast, all things are completed. Look at this, Revelation chapter 15, verse one. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. Seven is always associated with completion in prophecy. God completed the earth and the heavens and all that is in them in six days. And then on the seventh day, he rested in remembrance of his completed, all of his created. So during the seventh month, starting on the 15th day of the month, the 10-5 day, was to begin this last feast of the Israelites year. Because with it, everything is wrapped up. Everything is finished. It's completed. They were to live in suckers or in booths 
for seven days. But then on the eighth day, the great day of the feast, they were to observe a holy convocation. The number eight is the number of new beginnings. Eternity, my friend, eternity. That means eternity, new beginnings. The feast looked forward to and celebrated eternity with Jesus. Eternity when we will have a new beginning that will never, ever, ever end. It is the only feast still being celebrated in the millennial reign of Christ. Look with me at Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16 through 19. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there will be no rain. There shall be the plague with which the Lord afflicts the nation that do not go up to keep the feast of booths. This shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the feast of booths. And DARPA will not be able to help you with that one. This is a prophecy about the millennial reign of Christ. But someone might say, Brother Kenny, how do we know that this is really the millennial reign of Christ? Well, turn with me to Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mountain moves northward and the other half moves southward. The very next time that Jesus puts his foot upon the earth is on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives splits. When he comes back, to reign and to rule for a thousand years, he descends on the Mount of Olives. And this is what that verse is talking about. During this time, we will still be celebrating the Feast of Booths. As a matter of fact, the only feast that is mentioned or celebrated in the millennial reign of Christ is the Feast of Booths. Why? Because that is the only feast that will not be fulfilled by then. Then when the fulfillment of that great and awesome day of the feast comes, eternity will be here. Look at what Revelation chapter 21 verse 3 and 4 says. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore for the former things have passed away. The Feast of Booths, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, is simply Emmanuel, God with us. God dwelling amongst his people. For God will be with us forever and ever right here on the new earth. We will see him face to face. We will walk with him hand in hand. He will be with us and we will be with him forever and forever and forever and forevermore. He will be our God and we will be his people. And all the former things like mourning and sadness and crying and weeping and hurt and pain and fear and anxiety, despair and hopelessness, hunger and thirst, robbing and stealing, oppression and persecution, wickedness and cruelty will all be wiped away. When our God makes all things new, he loves us. He loves you and he loves me. He wants good things for us. And he is coming back to give us those good things. The good things that the world has deprived us of. 
Jesus is going to restore them to us when he comes back. So are you ready for that great day of the feast? The eternal reign of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus offers living water to whomsoever will come. He said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Zechariah said, on that day living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 21 verse 6, to the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. Would you like a drink from the spring of life for free? Jesus is offering free life, life eternal. It's all free. Jesus himself provided it, everything. He provided it himself for us. Whomsoever will, let him come. Let him drink freely. So, are you ready to drink that living water? Are you ready for the great return of Christ? If you're not, you can be. All you have to do is to confess your sins, believe with your heart that Jesus has forgiven you, and you will be forgiven. So, if you're ready to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Believe it in your heart. Believe that Jesus has saved you. If you're ready, let us pray. Heavenly Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. I have not kept myself as you have said. I have done awful things. Forgive me. Make me ready, Lord. Help me to live for you, that when you come back, I will be ready. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me life, eternal life, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and all your unrighteousness. Nothing that you've done will be remembered against you ever again. What you got to do, though, is you got to keep in the way. You just can't go back doing the same old things that you used to do. You gotta get your Bible, get a Bible, read your Bible every single day so you can know what Jesus expects of you. Don't listen to somebody else. Yes, listen to your preachers, go to church, be discipled in your church. Find a Bible believing church who believes in holiness, who believes in righteousness, who preaches those things, who expects you to live that way, holy and righteous. Join that church, be disciple in a church, yes. But also read the Bible for yourself that you may know beyond a shadow of a doubt what Jesus expects from you. The scriptures are accurate. Yes, there are those who says that, oh, the scripture's been changed. It's a lie. God has preserved his word. If he couldn't preserve his word, he's not God. And he is God. He's all powerful, all knowing, and almighty. He has preserved his word that you will know what to expect and what he expects. Read your Bible every day. I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. Be blessed and stay blessed.